Welcome to Tales from the Periodic Table. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about the element ytterbium. Now I have a small sample of ytterbium here in this vial right here. It's a little bit hard for you to see, so I put it on my scanner and uh, give you, I can give you a little close-up view of that. Here we go. Uh, it's a shiny silvery metal when you keep it inside of the glass vial. It tarnishes in air. Here we see the beautiful periodic table produced by Theodore Gray. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Teo has written one of my favorite books called The Elements, which I encourage you to go and pick up. Check out his fantastic website, periodictable.com. Ytterbium is the 70th element in the periodic table. Its atomic number is 70 because that's how many protons are in its nucleus, and that is what distinguishes it as a unique element. In 1878, Swiss chemist Jean-Charles Galassard de Marignac was the first to isolate ytterbia, the oxide of ytterbium, from other rare earth oxides. Specifically, erbia. His sample of erbia, which was really erbium oxide, seemed to contain an impurity. He isolated this impurity and called it ytterbia. The actual metallic element was not purified until 1953. Check out the previous episodes of Tales from the Periodic Table for the interesting path to the isolation of erbia. A small and crude sample of ytterbium metal was first made in 1938 by Heinrich Bomer, sorry I couldn't find a picture or dates for him, and Wilhelm Klemm. They both apparently worked with Linus Pauling on the structure of metals and intermetallic compounds. A relatively pure sample of the metal was not obtained until 1953. Many rare earths, including ytterbium, were obtained from an ore discovered in an obscure mine in the town of Yitterby, Sweden. This small city has four elements named after it, yttrium, terbium, erbium, and yitterbium. In addition, two other Yitterby rare earth elements, holmium and thulium, are also named for Sweden. Holmia is the Latin name for Stockholm, and Thulium was named after Thule, an ancient Greek place name associated with Scandinavia. All these elements from ores of the Yitterby mine. Not bad for a town with a population a bit over 3,500. The Yitterby mine has many rare earths, but isn't big enough to be commercial. One commercial source of rare earth elements is the mineral monazite. Monazite is a phosphate with lanthanum, cerium, praseodymium, and neodymium as major substituting elements, and most of the other rare earths as minor constituents. It's usually found in the form of a sand with other minerals. China, India, Madagascar, and South Africa have large deposits of monazite sands. Another source of rare earths, including a very tiny bit of ytterbium, is the mineral basnesite, which is a carbonate fluoride with lanthanum, cerium, praseodymium, or yttrium as major substituting elements. Ytterbium is also found in the mineral eusenite, which is also a source of uranium and thorium. One last rare earth containing mineral has the coolest name, xenotime. This is normally a yttrium orthophosphate, but other elements can take the place of the yttrium, including ytterbium. Let's take a look at the rare earth content of a few of the previous minerals. You can see from this table, ytterbium appears in low percentages in these minerals, accounting for up to only 0.01% of bastnesite, up to 0.51% of monocyte, and 6.2% of xenotime. Even though ytterbium oxides only occur in small amounts in monocyte, so much of this mineral is processed for other rare earths, it turns out to be a major source of this element too. 
Ytterbium belongs to a row of elements known as rare earth metals, or lanthanides, since lanthanum is the first element in this periodic table row. Ytterbium is the 14th and penultimate element of this series. Technically, both scandium and yttrium are also included in this group, since they are both members of the same periodic table column. Both the lanthanide row and the actinide row below it actually fit in the two spaces after barium and radium, but if we displayed the table in this fashion it becomes too long and unwieldy to fit in books or on posters. The element ytterbium is uncommon, coming in as the 53rd most abundant element in the universe by mass, only two parts per trillion. Not much more abundant in the Sun, it's the 62nd most abundant element, half as concentrated compared to the universe at one part per trillion. It's the 55th most abundant element in meteorites, about 180 parts per billion. In the crust of the Earth, it's the 46th most common element at 2.8 parts per million, about the same as tin. Ytterbium is the 64th most abundant element in the oceans, virtually non-existent at only 800 parts per quadrillion. And lastly, and not surprisingly, there is no ytterbium in us. As with most elements, the price of ytterbium varies widely with purity and the quantity you buy. 99.99% pure ytterbium oxide goes for about $30 per kilogram. The pure metal is about $50 per kilogram, shockingly inexpensive considering its rarity. This complicated version of the periodic table shows the evolution of the elements through the history of the universe. Here, you see each element square with a tiny chart of its own showing that element's growth over the age of the universe by various processes. Ytterbium is here. Now, I understand this looks complicated, but let's look at just ytterbium a little closer. The horizontal axis of this square represents time from the Big Bang until now. The vertical axis shows the proportion of ytterbium created by various processes. About half of ytterbium present today is believed to be produced in supernovae, the yellow area. The other half is produced in dying low-mass stars, the magenta area. A small amount, that green sliver on the top, is produced in neutron star mergers. Note the ytterbium produced in dying low-mass stars, the magenta area, doesn't get started until a bit later in the history of the universe. That's because low-mass stars exhaust their nuclear fuel much more slowly and last a long time before they start dying. Each element has many different forms. For each specific element, the number of protons in the nucleus is the same. 70 protons for ytterbium, but there can be different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. All these different forms are called isotopes. They're chemically identical to each other, but with slightly different weights. The number you see next to the chemical symbol is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. There are 35 known isotopes of ytterbium. Of these 35, there are 7 stable non-radioactive isotopes. These isotopes occur in nature in varying amounts, as you see here. By the way, the word isotope comes from the Greek isos meaning same or equal, and topos meaning place, since all these various forms of ytterbium occupy the same place in the periodic table. Of the radioactive isotopes of ytterbium, these five are the longest lived, the ones with half-lives over one hour. More about half-lives in the next slide. The longest lived isotope is ytterbium-169, with a half-life of only 32 days. If you encounter any ytterbium-169, it was artificially made. What's a half-life? This graph shows an exponential decreasing curve. As an example, let's say we start with 1,024 atoms of any isotope from the previous slides. 
I chose 1024 atoms because it's a power of two and we'll be doing a lot of divisions by two. If you wait one half-life, half of your isotope will decay and you'll have 512 atoms left. If you wait one more half-life, half of that half decays, leaving you with one quarter of the original 1024 or 256 atoms. Another half-life, half again as many or 128 atoms, and so on. Just keep dividing by two every half-life. After 10 half-lives, you'll have about one one-thousandth of your original amount. By the way, notice there's one remaining atom after 10 half-lives here. If you waited one more half-life, your remaining atom would have a 50-50 chance of decaying in that time. Ytterbium has a medium low density at 6.57 grams per cubic centimeter. As a reminder, water has a density of 1 gram per cubic centimeter, and I've put up a few more densities for you here. Here's a graph of the elements from highest density to lowest density. When I do this talk with an actual audience, I have a set of blocks so you can actually feel density for yourself, but we'll have to wait to do this until we're back face to face. My set of blocks have a wide range of densities, with the densest at tungsten, to lead, to copper, to iron, to titanium, to aluminum, to magnesium. I also have plastic and wood blocks, but those are not technically elements. Again, ytterbium has a density of 6.57 grams per cubic centimeter, the magenta circle just below antimony. Ytterbium has a fairly low melting point at 824 degrees Celsius or 1515 degrees Fahrenheit. It boils at 1,196 degrees Celsius, or 2,185 degrees Fahrenheit, only 372 degrees Celsius above its melting point. It has the smallest liquid temperature range of all the metals. If we compare the size of the ytterbium atom to that of hydrogen, we'd see something like this. The ytterbium atom is a little over four times the size of hydrogen, 222 picometers in diameter, the exact same as our previous element, thulium. All the lanthanides share the property of those two loosely held outer electrons, and this makes their atoms fairly large. By the way, a picometer is a trillionth of a meter. Atoms are very, very small. Here, our atom size is sorted from largest, cesium on the left, to smallest, helium on the right. Ytterbium has the 13th largest sized atom of the elements. All the rare earths are fairly large. Uh, I'll mark the others lanthanides in blue. Notice how they're all clustered towards the top of the chart. As I mentioned, they all have those loosely held outer two electrons. As far as hardness goes, ytterbium is on the soft side, coming in at 3.4 on Mohs scale of hardness, maybe a tiny bit harder than copper at 3.0. Ytterbium has the second largest rate of thermal expansion among the lanthanides and the 11th highest expansion rate of all the elements, about 26.3 parts per million per degree Celsius. This means that if you had a one meter long bar of ytterbium, we'll have to magnify this by a factor of 10 just to see it, and you heated that bar by one degree Celsius, it would get longer by only 26.3 millionths of a meter, about half of a hair width. Here's the periodic table of the spectra. Ytterbium has a complicated set of emission lines. These emission lines uniquely identify the element to scientists. No other element gives off these colors when excited. Let's take a look at a few applications of this rare earth element. Added in very small amounts to steel, ytterbium has been shown to improve grain refinement, strength, and other qualities of the alloy. I doubt this is widely used due to the cost of the element and the vast number of other elements that can do similar jobs 
at a lower cost. A source of X-rays that does not require power can be created with a bit of radioactive ytterbium-169. This is made from the relatively rare and stable ytterbium-168 by adding a neutron in a nuclear reactor. The ytterbium-169 is placed in a protective lead shield. You stand in front of this. When the ytterbium is revealed, the low-energy gamma rays which can also be considered high-energy x-rays, pass through you. Your bones can absorb some of the rays. Those rays expose film, creating what we call an x-ray. Again, no power needed. Rare earth elements introduced as impurities, called dopants, into yttrium aluminum garnet, or YAG laser rods, can cause the output laser light to occur at different wavelengths. The most common ones are neodymium YAG lasers, which produce light at a wavelength of 1,064 nanometers, or about 1 micron, in the infrared. Ytterbium-doped YAG lasers at 1,030 nanometers, also about 1 micron in the infrared. Other rare earth dopants include holmium chromium thulium triple doped YAG, which has a high efficiency and lasers at 2,080 nanometers, or about 2 microns in the infrared. Erbium doped YAG lasers at 2,940 nanometers, or almost 3 microns. And Neodymium cerium double doped YAG is similar to neodymium YAG, lasing at the same infrared wavelength as plain neodymium YAG. Lasers work by a process called stimulated emission. First, one has to bring atoms, in this case a smattering of ytterbium atoms in the YAG crystal, into an excited state. This can be done with a flash of light. A single photon entering the crystal can stimulate an excited atom to give up its energy as a photon. These two then continue in the same direction, causing a cascade of other atoms to give up their energy. A larger, meaning brighter, light pulse exits the crystal, or, in other words, is amplified. As a matter of fact, the acronym LASER stands for Light Amplification by the Stimulated Emission of Radiation. And now you know why. Perhaps the most interesting use for ytterbium is in a new experimental type of atomic clock. A group of about 10,000 ytterbium atoms are held in a cage of laser beams and cooled to only one ten millionth of a degree above absolute zero. Another laser is used to stimulate these atoms 518 trillion times a second. This frequency is stable to within less than two parts per one quintillion, meaning this clock would be off less than a second in the entire age of the universe. Your body does not use ytterbium, but probably still contains a few micrograms or nanograms absorbed from the environment. As usual, we'll end this talk with Mary Soon Lee's elemental haiku about ytterbium. Stable to within two parts in a quintillion, atomic clock ticks. In the next program in this series, we'll examine the next and finally last lanthanide element, lutetium. I hope you'll join me. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman. Thank you for watching this Tales from the Periodic Table program about the element ytterbium.